It's a weekly Sunday morning seminar that we offer the Duluth community to learn about the amazing work being done throughout the Twin Ports area. And today we have the chance to learn about connecting through crisis. What is the Community Crisis Response Program and how can we connect someone who needs help to the program? Join us today as Courtney Buckholtz, RN, Community Crisis Response Program Supervisor, discusses this critical program offered through the Human Development Center in Duluth, or HGC. Courtney will also discuss de-escalation techniques and how the program partners with other providers in our area can help those in crisis. We are so grateful for you being here, Courtney. Thank you for joining us, and please give me, uh, join me in giving a warm welcome to our guest this morning. All right, ooh, I hate using mics, so this is gonna be problematic. Um, I'll do my best. All right, so, <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna hope for the best. All right, so as was said, my name is Courtney Buchholz. Um, I started at the Human Development Center back in November of 2021. Before that, I owned an assisted living, um, and that was my, I think, I grew up in some different crisis situations at times, and then when I hit the assisted living, I didn't realize how many crises would be there. It was really um, a lot of really great experience with de-escalation and all of these things. Hello. Um, so we started off with only three crisis team members. How many of you guys know what mobile crisis response is? All right, a couple. Yeah. Oh no, yes. That means I have to see myself and <laughs> Oof, the worst. All right, so <laughs> here we go. So, um, like I said, I started with Mobile Crisis right before they started, HDC started their Mobile Crisis program. We started off with three responders to cover the entire city of Duluth and all of South St. Louis County. And as you guys can imagine, it's been really busy, right? Um, so we started our crisis team December 7th of 2021. And when we started off with just the three of us, we were called, we were working in shifts kind of around the clock. We're a 24 seven entity. So um, our response program. So we were doing a lot. It was really, really busy. Over time, we have thankfully expanded to 16 mental health practitioners or 16 crisis responders, as well as a cr uh, clinical supervisor. And then my role of community, um, what am I, the community crisis response supervisor. Um, I've recently stepped out of my role into a new, um, a new entity for HDC, which I'm gonna talk about later as a registered nurse, but I'm still doing some of these talks within the community. All right, so we're gonna talk a lot about our program and what it is, but first we're gonna talk about how it started. So mobile crisis has been in our area for quite some time, however, um, there were several people within our community that felt it wasn't quite as robust as maybe they were hoping for. Um, people, were, they weren't going out into the mobile crisis situations as often. Sometimes we're being told, like, we can't respond in that type of a crisis and whatever it was. So they wanted someone else to take it over. HDC went for that grant and was able to secure it. Um, they established this current program and were able to obtain additional funding through the city of Duluth. Um, with the city of Duluth funding, it's been really amazing because we have been able to add a lot more to our program, which we'll talk about. All right, so first and foremost, mobile crisis. So do you guys know, have you guys seen the big billboards for 988? Okay, the crisis response number. So I just want you to wipe 988 from your brain for a little bit because 988 is a na nationwide phone number to call in, in a crisis situation. However, unlike 911, 988 is not geolocated. So this is very problematic as you can imagine because when someone comes calls in and they're a UMD student from California, their call goes back to California and they may not have those crisis services, they bump that call back to our 911 and they don't know what's going on and they send the police out. And the whole point of our program is to not to have to send the police into a mental health crisis. So that can get really problematic. So the number to remember, which I will email so you can distribute it through the church, does that sound good? Okay. There's a number to remember, which is 844 772-4724. I'm gonna have to have Nate, right? 772-4724. Um, so that number is the best number to call. It goes straight to first call for help. First call for help 
is out of Grand Rapids, Minnesota. They're like dispatch for 911, right? But all mental health. They cover 38 different entities. So a lot of different programs are using First Call for Help to get people connected to services. Um, so when First Call for Help gets a, gets a call, they look and see what county the person's calling from and who they're gonna connect them to. When they do that, they have to make a few decisions. Sometimes a person is calling because they just need someone to talk to, right? They're having kind of the worst day and they need someone to talk to. They need to engage in some services. They just need some support over the phone and they will stop at that level. At other times, they need someone to show up in their crisis and that's where our team comes in. So when someone calls and needs our services, they get through to one of our team members, we warm line them or talk to them for a little while. We conduct a, um, an asset, or sorry, we conduct a screening. And after our screening, we decide if we need to go out and how we're gonna respond. There are some, there are some times when we can go with just two responders and it's perfectly fine. There are some places that we have deemed as safe places like the hospitals, nursing homes, places that are staffed that we can go with just one responder and that's fine. There are other times, however, when the, when the crisis is deemed like, we don't know if this is a safe situation or not. Maybe there's some domestic altercation that's happened, things like that. And we'll do a co-response with the police just to ensure their safety as well as ours. Um, so there are multiple ways to respond. When we go out to these crises, we have gone, so I personally have assessed people at Burger King, um, the holiday, uh, a couple of different Starbucks, nursing homes, assisted living, grade schools, high schools, middle schools, the colleges, we go to people's homes, we will go to, if a person is homeless, we'll put them in the back seat of our car and drive around to warm them up while we're doing the assessment. So maybe my partner's typing and I'm driving and chatting because I can't seem to stop doing that. But we work it all out, okay? And we get people to connect it with other services. So there are lots of services in the Duluth area. For as much as we wish there were more, we do have a lot of options, which is really great. So we've connected people with Safe Haven, PAVSA. Um, sometimes we'll have to bring a person to the hospital. Maybe they're doing really poorly. And um, a person can go to the hospital and get kicked out 15 to 20 minutes later because they don't meet the criteria for a hospital stay. Um, so our team will go and sit with them to really advocate for them to get a bed and a place there. And um, so those have been things that have been really helpful as well. While we're doing that, while we're driving around with them, whatever it is, we're using different de-escalation techniques. Um, basically, you're keeping yourself calm in the middle of someone's crisis, right? How many of you guys have seen like the duck on the water? And the duck looks like really serene, right? And really peaceful and it's so wonderful. But what's happening under the water? little feet are going like 900 miles an hour, right? And that's often what's happening in our brains. Like we will appear very calm on the surface, things are going really well, but inside you're like, I don't know what I'm gonna do with this one, right? That's the way we feel in other people's crisis or our own a lot of times. So, um, like I said, we do a lot of things trying to get people sheltered. We connect them with housing services. We have filled out insurance applications for them before to get them reconnected with with medical providers we take people to pharmacies to get their meds filled all of those things and that's mobile crisis one of the things that we've discovered is that within um, a crisis a person obviously needs some therapy right maybe some psychiatry something like that so when they need that we could set them up for services and three to six to 12 weeks later they could get in to see a therapist that's not very effective in a crisis, right? And with rapid access psychiatry, with a, with a psychiatrist, we could get them in sometimes three to six months later. Also not super effective in a crisis. So we have two different parts of our program. One is crisis therapy. We can get people in for same day appointments sometimes. We can get them in usually within 24 to 48 hours though to see a crisis therapist. We also have rapid access psychiatry. So if a person meets the correct criteria for it, we can get them in to see one of our psychiatrists or um, a psych nurse practitioner. Um, we can get them then within 72, 48 to 72 hours, somewhere in there, which is also a great thing because sometimes medical providers, they're generalists, right? They might not know what the right psychiatric medication or the most beneficial one could be. So our psych providers can work with that provider to make sure there's, there's good coverage there. All right, so that's the mobile crisis piece. The other umbrella is the city of Duluth funding that we got. So without the city of Duluth funding, we would not have enough providers to be able to do the following services. 
which is outreach and mental health welfare checks. So outreach is kind of what I like to call crisis prevention because we can be out, um, let's see, maybe we have a family member or a, a concerned community member that's like, hey, this person, I know they're really starting to not do well and whatever else, we can do some outreach with them. We do a lot of street outreach, going out to the skywalks, going out, we go to the CHOM, the warming center, um, we have somebody stationed at the library, just to kind of touch base with people if we notice, like, hey, they don't seem to be doing very well, we can offer things like hand warmers, gloves, scarves, food, connection to resources, whatever that is, it's preventative of crisis happening, which is a really great thing. Another thing was, the, uh, one of the first calls I got as a new provider, and like I said, there were only three of us, one of the first calls I got was from a dad who was out in California, I believe, um, and he was really concerned. His son, his son was living with schizophrenia, and um, he was just really struggling. He hadn't been able to get a hold of him for a few days. Um, the last time the police had shown up, it had just been a really quite a volatile situation um, because of how he responded to people in uniform. And so he was wondering if we could go and check in with his son. Well, at that time, we didn't have the capability of doing what's called a mental health welfare check. And so we identified that as like, this is a really serious need. After that, we received multiple um, calls for that type of thing. So we were able to use the city of Duluth funding to go do that. It's taken a load off of police and they're really happy about it because they aren't trained in mental health. So they're really pleased with it. And it's also given us a lot more ability to get people services really quickly. Because when the police respond, yeah. When the police respond, they don't really have the, um, they don't have all the resources we do, right? They also don't have the time that we do. Officers can spend a really short amount of time. We can spend a couple of hours with a person sometimes. Now, not every time because sometimes crisis is blowing up, but for, we do the best we can to be able to offer of ourselves a lot of time and resources and everything. So those are some of the ways that we've been able to do, um, to do the mental health welfare checks. Um, we also have a registered nurse who's paid for by the City of Duluth funding. She works with the um, core team, which is the co-response team with the DPD. Um, she is really great at what she does, and what's been really nice there is that it's given us a really important link between our team and DPD to be able to get really quick responses. Um, she also is able to, if we have someone that we're really concerned that this is a pretty volatile situation, um, she can look up and see maybe if it's a mental health welfare check, where are they located right now? If it is something that she doesn't walk, want us walking in blind to, she can kind of give us a heads up on some things. So that part has been really helpful. Um, that part has been really helpful as well. So as I said at the beginning, my role was community, uh, the community coordinator. I can't ever remember what my title was. So anyways, um, nor can I now. So <laughs> my role was the community coordinator. The position was created because we identified a huge problem with the stigma surrounding mental health, right? When you go down and you're walking around by the chum or driving past the chum, people don't want to pull over. They're scared of somebody that's experiencing a substance use crisis. People are afraid of people as soon as you say the word schizophrenia. People are like, oh my word, that's the murderer I saw on Law and Order one time, right? This, this, is, not the, this is not correct information. Um, a person experiencing serious and persistent mental illness, uh, things like schizophrenia, bipolar one, those types of things um, that are lifelong conditions. It's only three to 4% of the, the violence that happens in, our, in the United States is committed by people living with serious and persistent mental illness. That's a completely different statistic than we would think of, right, otherwise, um, because of the way the media influences things. So in saying this, I've been able to do a lot of community education. I've talked to different church groups. Um, I've talked to different entities up at different colleges and just offered a lot of information as to what mental health is, what mental illness is, and what mental wellness is. Because without knowing those things, people are going to be responding in a state of fear, which means maybe they're going to drive off. Maybe they aren't even going to smile at the person that's struggling out on the street because it's too frightening for them, whatever that is. So we're hopefully with that education able to um, get people to respond in a little bit more compassionate way because that can be hard when we're afraid to respond that way. And that's really what stigma is, is just a fear of what we don't know. Um, so, like I said, it's a lot of community education. Um, how many of you have heard of mental health first aid? Youth mental health first aid, yeah? So we offer that. Um, I am certified in both. 
I think I've taught around 150 now, um, but the really cool thing is, is it's been going so well and people want it so badly that they're actually going to be training four to five other um, team supervisors and stuff at HDC to, to be able to lead out in these programs because we want it to be this really big citywide, area-wide training that we can offer. It's a really, really great program. We talk a lot about different types of mental illness, how to how to support your own mental health and mental wellness, and then a ton of de-escalation techniques. Um, a little bit which we'll talk of which we'll talk about today, but um, that it's a very robust program. I think it's about eight hours, but it's a good time. Plus, you get to hear me for eight hours, which is everyone's dream, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> I know it's a good time. So, um, we also I also work really hard to increase the visibility of our program because if you don't know these services are out there, you're not going to call. And if you're afraid because of the stigmatization around mental health, you're going to call 911 because you're like, what is happening with this person? So, trying to just kind of increase our visibility in the area is really helpful. All right, a little bit about de-escalation. So we talked about the duck on the pond thing, right? How you might be feeling a certain way about the situation and just remaining calm can kind of be the best thing that you can do for the person. When a person starts yelling and their voice is getting up and their body posturing, have you seen that happen where the person goes, right and gets big around you to kind of show how how in charge they are of a situation making yourself smaller going quieter it's gonna they're gonna decrease their volume often this isn't every time but they're gonna decrease their volume because they want to hear what you're saying so you just keep going lower and lower and pretty soon they're getting lower and lower and as it's happening things are calming another thing is i know this is horrible but if they smoke offer them a cigarette because what does it do that calms you down. You're taking a big breath, right? You're taking a deep breath. Now, it's not a, an HDC legitimate thing, but I carry cigarettes with me. I also carry a lighter because uh, part of a crisis can be when you don't have a lighter for your cigarette and you just really need it at that moment. Um, so I carry lighters with me. Um, when, when we are trying to do de-escalation, we really want to just listen to the person. What is their struggle? now? Their struggle might be something that we are like, why is that even a thing? Like that's, I deal with that every Wednesday. Like that's not a big deal, right? To them, this is really intense. This is their crisis. So listening, having a lot of empathy and compassion, which I'm sure you guys are all great at, those are the most helpful things you can offer somebody in their crisis. Not showing fear is another really helpful thing. And then honestly knowing who to call in the crisis could be another thing. Just sitting, how many of you guys have done CPR training? Okay, so when you do that, you're not like cracking the chest and doing like a bypass, right? Very good, so I hope not, because that would be really awkward for me right now if you were. Um, so we're, we're not doing those things. The same goes for crisis response. When you guys see someone in crisis and you're responding, you're not there to be their psychiatrist, their therapist, or whatever. You're trying to get them through to keep them safe until another person or entity can come and take over, right? So now what you can do is you can take a deep breath, you can sit with them, you can listen to their story, you can just be there for them, and you can call crisis in the meantime to have them come and kind of take over in that situation. Get them connected with a therapist, with a psychiatrist, with whatever those needs are, and go from there. Okay, um, so I need water, and then I'm going to tell you some stories. Um, so as you guys can probably see, I talk a lot, and um, I could probably talk about crisis all day. I like it. It's what I do. I've moved from our crisis response program into crisis stabilization. So HDC, Human Development Center has three, or is coming up with three crisis programs now. We currently have Mobile Crisis. Um, the newest program we just opened is Yellow Leaf, uh, which is like, have you guys heard of Birch Tree? Okay, so it's like Birch Tree, it's crisis stabilization. We have 12 beds, it's 24 seven, and a person can stay up there for up to 10 days. Um, it is grant funded, so insurance is great, but we also have grant funding so that we, we aren't gonna be turning people away to, from getting that service. Well at, Bert, or well at Yellow Leaf or Birch Tree, either entity, 
Um, while they're there, they can receive, they can meet with a therapist, they can meet with a psychiatrist, um, we can do some medication changes, but mostly there are a lot of therapists and groups there to just really be able to offer support while a person's really struggling maybe with self-harm or self um, thoughts of suicidal ideations, different things like that. So we want to work with them there. Another really exciting program is the urgent care. Um, have you guys ever heard of the Clarity Project? Okay, so Clarity Project has been going on for, I think, eight to ten years. They've been talking about it. This is an urgent care behavioral health system. So just like instead of going to the emergency room, you're going to go to the urgent care at your local clinic, we're going to be in a, like a one-stop shop for behavioral health urgent care. It's going to be Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. till roughly 8 p.m. We'll have a ton of different services offered, but mostly, if a person isn't meeting the qualifications, for emergency room or a hospital stay, they can come there. Our crisis team is gonna be located there. It's gonna be a safe place that they can kind of come and just take a deep breath. We can connect them with services and a safe place to be for that time. Um, so that's opening in, I believe, July at this point. So it's kind of the trifecta of crisis. Not many other states that I know of have programs that are this robust. So the fact that Duluth does is a really, really encouraging thing. So like I said, I could talk about crisis all day, um, but it's not super fun to hear all the data and all this information unless we have stories behind it. So here we go. Uh, a couple of my favorites. My very, very first day of responding to crisis, um, I actually, let's see. So like I said, we started in November. We had all of these virtual trainings, right, which teach you nothing, to be honest. Um, you're just sitting there like, clicking through, like, oh my gosh, this is 12 hours of my life. I can't believe it. And you click through. And you're like, now apparently I'm like a crisis responder, so I'm certified for this, and here we go. So the night before uh, my first day of response, I got a phone call from a teammate who is no longer with us. And she said, this is the worst job I've ever had in my entire life. You need to leave now. This is so bad. Don't come in tomorrow. You would not believe the crisis situations and whatever else. And I was like, oh, my goodness. You know, that does not sound great. So I went in at 8 the next morning because I actually like crisis. And so I went in at 8 the next morning. And right off the bat, they were like, there's this guy. We brought him up to Birch Tree for crisis stabilization. He ran away, and now we can't find him and whatever else. So we went around, we went through our day and whatever at about, well, probably about three o'clock that afternoon, he called us. And he was like, hey, by the way, I am in a certain motel in Duluth. Why don't you come to my hotel room and we can hang out for a while? And I was like, probably not the hotel room, right? But maybe the lobby, we'll meet there. So we drove out to the area and we met him in the hotel lobby and he was talking and as you talked to him you knew that there was definitely a lot of mental health struggle going on and more than likely a lot of mania he was he was pretty amped up he had a lot of uh, grandiose ideas a lot of planning was going into his day he invited us once again to the hotel i said well how about burger king it's right it's right here so we walked over to burger king and as we're there there are so many things that I did wrong because that's crisis. You do a lot of things wrong and then you learn from that. So I sat on the inside. So you're supposed to have an escape route. That's number one. I didn't. Um, so I sat back here. My partner sat here. My partner was like 98 pounds soaking wet and terrified of crisis. She's the one who told me not to come in. So I was going to have to crawl over her to get out of there, which was not <laughs> ideal. <laughs> so he's sitting across from us in this booth and he has kind of all the power. He's got the, the way out and everything. So we started in on our, on our talk and my partner had met with him before, so she is kind of leading this. And I was just kind of getting to know him and listening. And as she's going, she said, fighting words, which were, I'm gonna need you to calm down. Don't say it. not ever, not to me, probably not to most of the girls I know. And just don't, it's not ideal. So she said that, he jumped up and pulled a knife, which I thought was a sword. It was like this, it was not, I mean, it could have hurt, but it wasn't a sword, you know, I thought it was. So anyways, he pulls up and he's like, da da da, waving this thing around. So I look around, there's a person running the till, making the burgers. There's a dad with a son and then there's the three of us. So I was like, okay, we gotta keep these guys safe and you're playing all these things out in your mind and how are you gonna respond? And my partner is vibrating with fear next to me and I'm like, oh, this is not, this is not the most ideal situation, right? And so I like looked at him and I said, you know, I do not want to die chubby and hungry in a Burger King. So I need you to just like sit back down. And he was like, well, oh, 
okay. And he stops, because you can use humor sometimes to de-escalate and diffuse some of those situations, right? So he was like, well, I didn't, I didn't mean to scare you. I, I just was trying to tell you how I was feeling. I was like, oh no, I got that. Like, I know how you're feeling. Whatever, he's like, why didn't I go buy you a burger? So he did. He went over here and bought me a burger and a coffee and comes back. And in the meantime, I'm getting out of the booth because it's not a great situation, once again. So we walked around. And I said, well, you know, thanks for the burger. We need to get going because we have some other people we need to work with and whatever. Side note, I need to call the police because you pulled a knife on us, but I didn't say that. Um, <laughs> so, because it's a little more wrecking. Um, and so I said, we need to get back out to our car. And he goes, well, you know, this is a really terrible neighborhood. A lot of violence here. So I'm going to walk into your car. And I'm like, oh, all right, thanks. He's going to protect you. He was. You know what? Hey. He's a real gentleman, so uh, I just loved him. So we walked out, he got us to our car, he's waving goodbye, and he has his waving goodbye, I'm like, 911. So we have a situation. This guy really, really, really needed help. He needed help for his mental health. He was going to hurt himself. He was, something was gonna happen. So we went back to the office, my partner went home, bless her heart, she probably needed to de-stress for about nine hours, it was rough. Um, I ended up responding back with the police. We got to his hotel room, we knocked, he identified that he had another weapon, he had a gun, he said. So we ended up making a safety plan that he would call me if he needed anything and we were able to, to get out of that situation. The next day I got a phone call, it was from my buddy. We ended up meeting at a Euro shop. Um, we were there for, I, I don't know if it was two hours or nine, it was probably between two and three though. Um, and the entire time we were there, he was, he was here, right? He was escalated, he was ready to go. My officer, the officer I'd worked with the night before, thankfully was on for another 12 hour shift. He was waiting in the parking, uh, parking lot at Quick Trip across the street, just in case things went sideways. Um, the plan was is that I would get him to the emergency room. He needed hospitalization. He was very, very ill. Um, let's see, we talked, like I said, for three hours. As we were there, he was introducing me as his friend, the stripper nun. And I'm like, no, but I just go with it because I'm like, what else am I going to do? So I'm just, yeah, hi, and more oh. tried a little bit. So there was that. Um, and so we finally got to the point where he trusted me enough and I said, look, I have this friend, he's an officer, I know you're not comfortable with that, but what would you say if we could bring you out and get you to get some help and everything? So he said that he, he thought that would be all right. So we got out. To make a long story short, he ended up, he wouldn't get in the officer's car. He finally would get in my car, so the officer said, why don't you bring him to the hospital? Another side note, put people in your back seat, not your front seat. I'm afraid of getting choked out from behind, so I thought I'm going to just you know, have him in the front with me, but he took the wheel when we were in the tunnels, which was another exciting part. He also wanted to regulate the music and he was really into like the most horrific, like, I don't know what kind of music it was, but it was very intense, like uh, mosh, what is it called, a mosh pit? Yeah, like mosh pit type of music, super loud. And I just roll with it. We got into the, we pulled into the um, emergency department area and they closed the big doors behind us. And that's when it all kicked in for him. And he got mad and he got scared and he's in my car and all of a sudden cops are coming out and security guards are coming out and the doctors are coming out and the nurses are coming out. And I was just like, look, I will hold your hand the whole time. I will stay with you. I won't leave you, I promise. And so I'm standing there, I'm sitting in the car with him. Finally, he, he says, okay. So I get out of the car and I was like, if you guys could just, like just, step back for a second. I'm going to go. I told him I'd open the door. So I open the door. I hold his hand. A nurse goes to try to put a mask on. I just feel like it's not the time. But anyways, she's trying to put a mask on. He gets more upset. We finally get him into the room. And like I said, everyone is scared, right? This is a really heightened situation. This guy is, he was like 6'4", six, 6'5". Six, he was a really big dude. And they thought they were going to have to do this takedown. No one is talking kind to him. He's posturing like I showed you before. He was making himself big, but I'm holding his hand the whole time, right? And as I'm holding his hand, his whole hand is just vibrating because he's terrified of what's about to go down, right? He knows. He's been through this before. People are not kind in those situations. So we get into the room. It's one of those big glass doors. Everybody's got their badges and their, you know, whatever taser things are on their hip and all that stuff. And I'm standing by him and the doctor said, well, we need to give you some injections, so I need you to take off your clothes. Side note, you don't have to take off people's clothes to give injections, but I don't think he was aware. So he kept pushing that. And finally he said, do you need us to take off your clothes for you and take you, to, you know, we'll have to, well, we can take you down and take them off for you. And it was like, oh my gosh, this guy is up to here, right? 
So I said, hey, since you've been calling me a stripper nun all day, how about if I take off your clothes? And you can play this horrible, terrible music that you've been listening to all day. So I put the phone up to his ear. He's holding that. I undressed him, got him in his hospital gown, sat him down. He finally said he would eat something. So I'm sitting on the bed next to him. He's eating his sandwich. We, he finally laid down. They gave him his injections. And he went to sleep. And I was able to leave the situation after some paperwork. <laughs> and I have never heard anything about him again. I've never seen him again or heard from him. And it's a hard thing to work really hard for someone's betterment and not be able to know the end of the story, right? All right, I know we're really close to being out of time, but I have one more story for you. Um, how about a different ending to that one? Isn't that the worst? We were all looking for that other ending. So was I, I right. still am, right? All right, about a month into crisis work, I got a call from a uh, law enforcement officer with DPD who was way out in another part of town. And he said, hey, I've got a mom here. She says she poisoned her kids. And when I got here, we, there's no signs of that or anything like that, but she's not doing well at all. We need help. We can't get a hold of CPS. We don't know what to do. So I said, like, and he said, the kids are starving. I tried to make an eggs, but there's no food and there's no clean pan in the house. It's just, it's really a mess. So I went over, I picked up Subway on the way for the kids. I went over there, I set them up in the dining room, such as it was. The house was just, it was in rough shape. Um, I, set the, I set the kids up with food and I walked around and the mom was in no condition to be doing an assessment. She needed emergency room care. Um, so it was decided that they would bring her to the emergency room and I would stay with the kids. So there were three kids um, and my partner ended up coming out and kind of helping because I said, we've got to clean this house. Like, Number one, they had a corned beef. The kids didn't know how to cook. They had taken a corned beef roast out of the freezer and microwaved it, and then they had one of those like electric saws halfway through it sitting on the table. There was just food and like garbage and refuse just everywhere. They're, they hadn't been cared for in a while, you know? It was really rough. Um, so we ended up getting there and cleaning, and we were playing with the kids and doing all these things. And in, as we're doing it, the middle daughter is really into it. She's going to show us what a great cleaner she is, so she's doing that. The youngest kid, he, he had decapitated like three stuffy animals because he played with them so hard. So I was sewing their heads back on because I also carry a sewing kit. Um, so <laughs> uh, it's like Mary Poppins. So I was sewing the heads on these bears and whatever else it was. And, but the oldest sister is nowhere to be found. After she realizes we're coming into her house, she wants nothing to do with us. So she goes upstairs. And slowly, people start coming. She starts coming down. Pretty soon, she's sitting on the landing, and she's just watching us. And we're, we have the house clean now. Things are organized. It's been about three hours. And um, we started playing ball back and forth with the two younger kids. And I noticed her walk around the back. And she went and stood by the curio cabinet. You know those big cabinets with like your most beautiful possessions? So they had like three things in this giant curio cabinet, but that area was spotless. There wasn't anything else in there besides their three favorite items. It was spotless. And that little girl, she was probably 12 or 13, she went and stood there and she's just dead silent, doesn't want to look at me, doesn't want anything to do with me. And finally she says, you know, she's not always like this. And that was it. The only thing she said. And I said, no, I know. And I just kind of smiled her way, though she wouldn't look. And that was it. That was the end of it. We continued to play with the other kids. We were able to get a hold of their family and CPS. Um, the family came out. They ended up not having to be removed from the home because the family was able to come and care for them. So we were able to help out in those ways. Um, you know, it was this really great thing because we were able to spend several hours. I love cleaning personally, not my own home, but others. And so we, we I was able to do that. It was this really great thing. And I, I love that we were able to do it. But the reason I always go back to this story was because of what she said. The only words that she said were that she wasn't always like this. And I can't tell you how many times I have heard like, oh, that's not really who my husband is. Or like, if you knew my son before this, you would have loved him, right? Over and over again. And I know that for me, struggling with addiction or different things that I've struggled with, my mental health, on my darkest day, I would sure hope that somebody would have the wherewithal to explain that that is not the totality of who I am. And I think it's important for us to remember those things. So we have no idea what people are going through, none at all. These people and these stories, this is just the tip of the iceberg. I could tell you 
hours and hours worth of stories, so could Nate. Anyone that works in our team of different people in need in our area and different people that are unsupported in our area. Uh, mom and dad struggling with their daughter who is an adult and just trying to get her help before she ends up hurting herself. Um, there was a mom that I worked with who had two daughters, one struggling with addiction, one struggling with mental illness. A uh, third daughter had overdosed and passed away. And she said to me, who is next? because it better not be me because I cannot be the next one for this. I met a woman who was trafficked from the time she was seven till she was 30. And during that time, her abusers put her on meth because they, she couldn't handle what was happening to her body. And she was still struggling with that method, meth addiction and worried about losing her children. Story after story of brokenness and hurting humanity and pain that is all over in the city that we live in. That's it. So in closing, I just want to thank you guys for you know being here today and listening to me chatter on and on. Um, the work that we do is really important. I love mental health. I love crisis response, and the fact that like we have we have received so much support within our city, specifically from churches and universities and stuff. I just can't tell you how much it means to all of us and to our team. Um, if you're interested in anything more, I'm always available, so you can let me or any of my team members know. And questions? Yeah. Well, first off, let's just give you a big round of applause. Thank you. And uh, I'll just be the guy with the mic so we can hear each other. And we'll start with you, Tom. Courtney, you mentioned earlier that the uh, 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 mental health is connected to only three or four percent of violence, violent acts. I don't know if you're saying gun violence or just violence in general, but all the gun violence we see always involves a comment about mental health. It was mental health. It was. If it's not, we should be going in another direction and getting that tail. We we know. We personally know around here people who take that very offensively that have mental illness. Mm -hmm. that's, you know, they say that's not true that all of this is, mm -hmm. all the violence is uh, mental health driven. So, like a lot of what we see being reported on, they're, they're linking with mental illness, right? But how many stories are there and, and crimes and stuff are, are there out there that maybe it's linked to a personality disorder? Maybe the person is antisocial personality disorder or something like that. But, but when we're talking about like those serious and persistent mental illness, schizophrenia, um, bipolar disorder, kind of the, the bigger ones that people really heavily associate with the violent crimes, there's only the reality is only three to four percent. And you're right, I mean more of this information needs to be out there because if we think it's as high as you know 90 percent of violent crimes are because of schizophrenia, we're going to be terrified, right, of the people that we serve or the people in our community that look or act or think differently than us. Yeah? I'm wondering about depression. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering about depression and how you handle people who are uh, suicidal mm -hmm. or on the verge of suicide. Yeah, so that looks really differently for everyone, obviously. However, um, our response is, even though it's tailored to the person, is often the same. A lot of it has to do with really listening to that person. Um, a lot of times people feel like there's no one that they can talk to in that, right? Whether it's because they don't have anyone and that's the reality, or the reality is that they maybe they don't want their family to know because they feel like they're disappointment. I worked with a kid one time, he was 21, and he didn't want to disappoint his dad, who had struggled with depression his whole life, and he was like, I can't be like him, he'll think it's all his fault and everything else, and the kid was highly suicidal. Um, so a lot of it is that, is that there's no one else in their life for them to talk to. So when we come in and we're, we're talking, usually the floodgates open within like the first five minutes and we start finding all the reasoning behind why they're feeling the way they are. And then just reminding them that this is m much more normal. M uh, we can normalize these things for them. It's much more normal than they believe it to be. And then, like I said, connecting with services. A lot of people will say no to a stabilization or the emergency room, obviously. If it's that, if it's a really high ideation with a plan and all of those things, then absolutely we get them to the emergency room and they have their hospital. Um, but if they aren't accepting any of those services, we'll safety plan, and that's often when we see um, them more willing to use like our therapists. 
and just to have another person to talk to. Also with crisis, it's not a one and done. So we try to follow up with people, especially, um, so with the first story that I mentioned, um, he ended up I'm being hospitalized and I don't know how that turned out. With the mom that I mentioned, we worked with her for months afterwards, um, making sure she got to treatment and a lot of different access to supports that she needed. So, um, you know, we're able to stick with people, especially people at high risk for suicide for quite some time. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. Uh, thank you so much for all of this. I apologize if you've already said uh, the answer to my question, but I heard you talk about sponsors. Are the city and county and state and federal government involved in that support? Yeah, so our funding comes from largely from the Arrowhead Behavioral Health Initiative, which is like state and county funding. So a big chunk of it comes from that. And then additional funding we received was from the city of Duluth. And so we received quite a bit of funding from there. And every entity that we've worked with has been unbelievably supportive. I mean, the police, I've, got, I've done tons of training for fire and safety for all of the DPD officers. We've done a lot of collaboration and everyone has been really on board with it, which has been really great. Because we, you know, you always worry about like, what if we're not meeting these needs or those needs and we're gonna lose funding? But so far, it sounds like everything is good. And do you have a multitude of partners then besides the ones you mentioned? I'm thinking of, of Chum and other entities. Yeah, so financially, no, but yes, we work with Chum a ton. So we go and do work at the Warming Center. Chum staff call our team directly um, to get help for in connecting people with services or getting help with de escalating someone. Um, like we do under our outreach funding, we have someone located over at the Chum in the evenings, and that can kind of help um, on the nights that we're able to because sometimes we're really busy. But when we can, we have someone over there, and that can help with some of that crisis prevention. Um, you know, not not everyone got into volunteering at the warming center for the de-escalation and mental health aspect. They just wanted to help people. And so we're able to deal with some of those things and make it maybe a little less scary. Thank you. So we got time for a couple more questions. Kathy. Courtney, again, I want to thank you for coming. I helped to arrange you and then I had to go. Oh, <laughs> but anyways, I've been involved with the Adventure Friendly Duluth project in the last couple of years. Uh, can you talk about if you get uh, it calls with folks that have dementia and how that may or may not be different from the other calls and what kinds of resources then are available for those folks and families? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that, so like I said, I did, I owned an assisted living for 10 years. Prior to that, I worked in, in elder care for 10 years. So it's been 20 years of that. And uh, a lot of my crisis training came from working with people who are sundowning with dementia Alzheimer's. So there, it is a different thing, right? Um, but we are able to go out to assisted livings and nursing homes when somebody is really dysregulated. Now, sometimes there are cases where when the staff working is one that they like or trust, maybe if they don't even know them, but they know it's a friendly face, um, and how that person is presenting themselves, that can be enough. We can kind of talk them through that. But when we respond specifically to those types of cases, I think the biggest thing is, is in your body stance, because they may not get all the words that are coming out of your mouth, even words of comfort, but they can hear your tone, they see your face and your body stance. And some of those are some of the biggest ways that we use to de-escalate in dementia cases and Alzheimer's cases. Um, so, you know, in the ways that it looks different is because the resources aren't as robust. So like the stabilization centers, we have two that are 24 beds, um, but we, we don't have CNAs. So they can't help with ADLs and those types of things. However, we are well connected with other entities like geriatric psych um, and those types of beds that can be helpful. The problem that I've noticed, not within crisis, but when I owned the assisted living, was the fact that there's a lot of over-medicating that can happen in some of those, right? And so I think it would be great if we had a crisis civilization specific to dementia care. Um, you know, that would be really helpful. But the, the resources are, are limited in that area at times, yeah. But we can definitely go out and help out with the staff. The other thing that can be really helpful are the mental health first aid seminars. Um, I've given them to a lot of group home staff, and they've felt like really a lot more supported than in their roles. Um, because maybe you've worked in group home care for 10 years, but if no one's talked through what mental illness and, and these different mental illnesses actually feel like, 
and how it presents and stuff, then you know, it makes it harder to work with sometimes. Yeah. We have uh, two questions here online. One is from Ron. Is Birchwood going to reopen? Do you know? So Birch Tree is co is currently open. Um, their crisis stabilization as well. They just moved locations. So we um, took over that building. Yellow Leaf, our HGC's crisis stabilization, is where they were at burning. Is it in the Burning Tree Plaza? Um, no. Nope. Thank you. Oh my lanta. You guys need directions. That's my own crisis. Anyways, um, but yes, we took over that and then um, the birch trees moved over to a place on Matterhorn Drive. So we're actually really close to each other, but they are currently open and accepting. Excellent. Um, I have one last question from online here. This is probably the perfect one to close with. And then I know Courtney, if anyone does want to talk one on one, is happy to stay up front. And obviously, uh, well, we'll close today with this great one, though, which is. Can you tell us a little bit more about the journey with Duluth being able to, you know, see a need and only have three mental health crisis responders and now have so many? Is that a lesson that other uh, communities our size can learn from? Are there other recommendations you would have so that other cities can go in the direction that we're going, where even though we're not where we need to yet, or at least in that direction with getting more support and grant funding and partnerships? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is is getting the word out there of how much need there is for a mental health response. I think that's a really big thing. So a lot of community education. Um, the way that we received funding, like I said, there were there was also the there was already the funding there from Arrowhead Behavioral Health Initiative. We just got that grant eventually. The city of Duluth funding came in so helpful as we were able to get way more staff, and that's what you need to be able to have a way more robust program. So a lot of places have a mental health our mobile health response uh, crisis program, but it's maybe only one, two, or three people. Ours is now, like I said, 16, and a lot of it is because we were able to obtain more funding because we showed all the different ways that we're responding in crisis. Um, and it's, you know, like I said, when you have the backing of the police, um, the sheriff's office, the mayoral um, office, all of those things, it's really helpful as well because they're seeing that need be fulfilled. So in other communities, um, I know that I live in two harbors, and even there, they're trying to get a more robust response with mental health uh, uh, welfare checks because they've identified that as a need. And as they do that more, and the police realize that's more available, they're more than happy to recommend that program because they know we have the resources that they don't. Well, on that note, thank you so much, Courtney. Let's give a huge round of applause. For that.